The insect world is terrifying. Around every corner, there's some other thing waiting to eat you by melting your insides or tearing you limb from limb. But what if I told you there's also insects that are serious threats to people? from a bug that can give you chronic heart problems to a man-made hybrid of a common garden variety insect, we're taking a look at the deadliest insects here in the US. The first one's probably lurking closer to you than you think. If you have pets, you've probably seen this at some point around your house. Fleas are annoying and largely we think of them as a pest, but these tiny flat insects are actually hiding some very sinister secrets. See, we all know that fleas bite. And the truth is their bite is what makes them dangerous, but it's not venom that causes the danger. See, fleas are a common vector for many really nasty diseases. The way they feed is similar to many of the hemipterans, the true bugs. Their mandibles have been modified over the generations into a straw-like mouth that they use to pierce the skin and drink tiny amounts of blood from the capillaries right by the skin's surface. They're so tiny that one or two bites you might not even notice. What typically happens is these tiny insects are feeding on mammals out in the wild. And at some point when your pets go outside, the fleas jump from wild mammals to your pets, and then eventually are able to also bite you. If things like bacteria didn't exist, this would just be a nuisance. Flea bites can be very itchy and very uncomfortable for your beloved pets. But the thing is, we live in the real world and bacteria do exist. And many of these wild mammals are carrying all sorts of really nasty pathogens. Throughout history, some of the deadliest diseases known to mankind were carried by fleas. The bubonic plague originally found in rats jumped to humans because the same fleas would bite the infected rats and then bite the humans that lived alongside them. Throughout most of America's history, typhoid fever was a very serious problem, also coming from fleas. While modern medicine has mostly eliminated the worst of the flea-borne illnesses, fleas still do kill people from time to time. To put it in perspective, you are more likely to die to a flea than you are to a black widow spider. When I was a kid, one of the insects that I was most afraid of was actually bees. But if you live in certain parts of the Southwest US, you might actually have something to fear with the bees that turn up in your backyard. The Africanized honeybee started as an agricultural project where biologists were trying to breed a bee that would have an easier time producing larger amounts of honey in tropical climates. But the problem is the making of this bee had some unintentional consequences. These Africanized bees tend to live in much larger colonies, and they also have some unusual behavior among bees that make them particularly dangerous. Honeybees are a social insect. They live in these hives where they serve the queen and function as a super organism. And while bees aren't super defensive on their own, they are extremely defensive of their brood. Bees have a very complex language of vibrations, dances, and chemicals. They talk to each other to help facilitate this cooperation as a hive. When a threat gets too close to their nest, they have signals they can give each other to basically rally the troops to help ward off an attack. And at some point, that signaling will become a cascade that causes the bees to swarm. Anyone who's been stung by a bee knows that one sting is pretty unpleasant, but getting swarmed can be actually pretty painful and pretty serious. Bee venom is surprisingly toxic. It's up there with many of the rattlesnakes here in the US. So an angry swarm can do some serious damage to your body. Many people are actually allergic to bees, which means when you're stung, you're not just getting the typical damage of a sting, but your body's also going into anaphylactic shock. Most bee-related deaths are due to anaphylactic shock, allergic reactions, not the potency of the bee venom. But it's this swarming behavior that has earned the Africanized honeybee the nickname, the killer bee. Where you have to get pretty close to the nest for typical honeybees to swarm you, the swarming radius of the Africanized bees is much larger. Having been attacked by these bees myself in the wild, I know firsthand there's times where you're walking around through the forest and you have no idea you're near an Africanized bee nest until they start swarming you. The Africanized bees tend to have larger swarms, so there's just more bees coming after you and they will chase you further from the nest than typical bees. As a result, in many of the remote areas that they've colonized, they can be a serious, serious threat. Sometimes I would consider these to be more dangerous than many of the snakes that I go after. This one is probably the least favorite insect of anyone in the United States. If you live in the deep south, you already know what you're looking at. This 
is the fire ant. Now, believe it or not, there's actually many different species of fire ant here in the US, and most of them are pretty much harmless. It's specifically one species that is actually problematic, and that is the red imported fire ant. These are an invasive species from South America, and they build massive colonies with hundreds of thousands of ants, and they are quite unpleasant. You can be walking casually through the grass and randomly get swarmed, and if you've ever been stung by fire ants, you know that it's quite a bad time. One or two stings you might not notice, but typically with fire ants, you're not getting one or two stings. Just like the bees, ants belong to the insect order Hymenoptera, and many Hymenopterans are these eusocial insects. They live in massive, massive groups, where the colony functions as one super organism. Particularly with ants, only the queen is reproductive. All of the workers are more or less clones, whose only purpose is to gather food, help build the nest, and if necessary, fight and sometimes die to defend the colony. And the fire ant has a pretty potent defense. Like all stinging Hymenoptera, they're venomous but fire ant venom is quite toxic. It's one of the most potent insect venoms on earth. But like the honeybee, that's typically not what kills you if you die to fire ants. Many of these hymenopteran venoms tend to elicit an allergic reaction a lot more frequently than things like spider venoms or snake venoms. But deaths to fire ants are due to anaphylactic shock. If you're stung by fire ants and you start having more than your typical burning pain, things like shortness of breath, tightness in your throat, any sort of swelling or fever far from the sting site, it might be worth seeking medical attention. But these ants aren't just dangerous to us, they're also dangerous to the environment. Many of these prolific invasive species will actually outcompete and kill many of the native species in the areas they colonize. This might be the insect that I have been requested to cover the most on this channel. The kissing bug is a very interesting case. Found throughout the southern half of the continental U.S., kissing bugs might be one of the most terrifying insects to ever walk the face of the earth. Worldwide, kissing bugs kill thousands of people every single year. And it's because just like the fleas, they transmit some pretty gnarly diseases, specifically a parasite that causes Chagas disease. Where normally we think of insects spreading bacterial or viral diseases, this is actually a protozoan, a much more complex unicellular organism that wreaks havoc on our system. Typically, it attacks the central nervous system and the cardiovascular system. Patients with Chagas disease tend to get brain damage or heart damage. And most commonly, Chagas disease doesn't kill you immediately, but instead causes chronic heart problems for the rest of your life. But the thing about the kissing bug is there's tons of misconceptions about what it is, what it isn't, and how it actually spreads the disease in the first place. Kissing bugs are a subfamily within the assassin bugs. So every kissing bug is an assassin bug, but there's this idea that's been circulating in my comments and on the internet in general that all assassin bugs spread Chagas disease. That's not true. Most assassin bugs are great garden helpers. They're gonna be eating the pesky insects that are eating your flowers or your vegetables, things that you don't want around. All kissing bugs are assassin bugs, but not all assassin bugs are kissing bugs. Kissing bugs have another name. They're called the blood-sucking cone noses. And the best way to identify them is that flat body plan with a very elongated snout past their eyes. Typically, assassin bugs have more of a sharp, prominent beak that folds under, and that's used for piercing the tough exoskeletons of the prey they're eating. Kissing bugs don't have as sharp of a rostrum because they actually don't want to cause pain when they're feeding on you in your sleep. Their goal is to be as discreet as possible, to sneak onto your face in the middle of the night, bite you, feast on your blood, and then get away unscathed. But it's actually not this bite that transmits the disease either. It's their poop. The parasite lives in the kissing bug's digestive tract when it's not infecting other hosts. And what happens is when the kissing bug feeds on you, it poops to make room for the new blood meal. And you start scratching that bite and that scratching motion brings some of that poop into the bite site and the parasite is able to enter your bloodstream. The crown jewel of deadly insects here in the US and deadly insects around the world is probably also the most irritating insect of them all. And that's the mosquito. I mean, literally, as I'm standing here in the shade in the woods, 
there are mosquitoes that are swarming me. Mosquitoes are practically everywhere once it's warm enough for them to be out, but they particularly like the shade. Now, the nice thing is most mosquitoes are actually not feasting on humans. Most of them are pollinators, and the males don't feed on people at all. It's only the females of certain species that are problematic because they're actually using proteins from the blood to help synthesize proteins in their eggs. They literally need our blood to reproduce. Despite how bizarre mosquitoes look, they're related to houseflies. They're in the insect order Diptera, but the mosquito is probably the most problematic fly that ever walked or flew on the earth. Just like the fleas, the reason mosquitoes are so deadly is not because they're somehow crazy venomous or something. They are actually one of the most dangerous vectors of life-threatening diseases worldwide. Here in the U.S., the most common mosquito-borne illness is West Nile virus. And even here in the U.S., we do record people dying from mosquito-borne illnesses all the time. But worldwide? Mosquitoes kill over 800,000 people every single year. That's over a thousand a day. Somebody is literally dropping dead from a mosquito-borne illness right now as I record this video. That is how serious mosquitoes are. The way mosquitoes actually hunt is pretty cool too. And this is also kind of how bug spray works. Turns out mosquitoes have three major things they're really tracking when they're finding us in the wild. They hone in on our body heat and our scent, but that's only when they're very nearby. The way they find us from further away is actually carbon dioxide. So mosquitoes actually have a gene that allows them to smell carbon dioxide. And the way that bug spray actually works, besides being toxic to mosquitoes, is it effectively masks that scent of CO2. It interferes with their ability to track us. So it's almost kind of like a cloaking device. If you wear bug spray, the mosquitoes have a harder time actually tracking you when you're out in the woods. And the danger with mosquitoes is not just the diseases they currently carry, but the diseases they could carry in the future. As the climate heats up, we're seeing more and more pathogens mutate evolve. There's a higher likelihood that diseases that affect different animals in the wild could jump to humans. But even worse, if you've been reading the comments even on my videos, there's a growing culture of anti-intellectualism in the modern age. A culture of rejecting and denying science. We're already seeing many diseases that were widely eradicated making a comeback in the U.S. due to certain populations rejecting medical science. This culture of science denial not only holds us back from making meaningful progress treating these diseases and fighting climate change, but also opens the door for even scarier diseases from our past to come back to haunt us. The insect world is quite scary, especially knowing that even though we're many, many thousands of times larger than even the largest insect, there are many of them that pose a real threat to our well-being. But the most important thing is to not be afraid of insects. One of my biggest goals with this channel is to bring the information to you so we can discover the natural world together and ask questions about the world around us. One of the best ways to beat fear once and for all is simply just through curiosity, being inquisitive about the world around you. And that's exactly the trick that I used to beat my own arachnophobia. As of this point in my career, I have worked with all of the world's deadliest spiders in their natural habitat. But I didn't start out that way. In this video right here, I got hands-on with a highly venomous redback spider to show myself that even medically significant spiders are not out to get me so that I could eventually conquer the deadly Sydney funnel web. It's quite the insane encounter, so I hope to see you there, but until next time, don't forget to get outside and find your own adventure.